Welcome to the U World Order Showcase Podcast. Your host, Jill Hart, the coach's alchemist. Couldn't be more excited to have you join us today. On this podcast, we celebrate the champions of change, the up and coming life, health and transformational coaches who are fearlessly stepping forward to make a difference in the world. Get ready for inspiring stories, practical tips, and powerful moments that will motivate you to make a positive change in your life and those around you. We're happy to have you join us on this incredible journey as we dive into the world of life, health, and transformational coaches who are lighting up the path towards a better tomorrow. Hi, and welcome to the U World Order Showcase podcast. I'm your host, Jill Hart, and with me today, we have Rosalind Rourke. Rosalind is a coach and author and former psychotherapist who has come full circle in her life. She works with those who are looking for the deeper meaning in life and are desiring new strategize old personality habits, and she uses Enneagrams to kind of tie it all together and help us understand where we're starting from and why those old patterns creep up on us all the time. (laughs) Welcome to the show, Rosalind. Thank you so much. So how did you get started? Tell us your story. So why why did you leave psychotherapy? um, I retired. Uh, I'm 76. So that's a reasonable age. I was in my 70s when I retired. Uh, I had a very successful psychotherapy uh, career. I loved the work. Um, My mother came to live with me and I had her at the end of her life. And uh, my daughter had a grandson, uh, her son, uh, a son, yeah, so my grandson. And so it was a great time to retire. And then um, unexpectedly, uh, my second daughter, Melissa, died. No warning, no illness that we knew of. Mm -hmm. And I went through the typical stages of grief that you would expect that you're written about, you know, denial, anger, bargaining, whatever, depression, no acceptance, because it, all of those are a fight with what is, if you think about it, denial, no, it couldn't have happened, anger, why, you know, depression, oh, how could life, how can I live without her, and so on, and then one day, and it had happened before, but I was too busy with my Uh, with my grief reactions to pay attention, I was physically shaken. I I say it just to describe it as being different from nervous or fluttery inside or something inside you. Um, And I was like, what is that? And I looked around, obviously there was no one there. I was not hallucinating because I was very aware that Melissa had died. I mean, I I wasn't in some altered state. I was remembering, but I had this overwhelming feeling of being okay. And then the next thought was, how can I be okay if my daughter died? The role, the expectation of a grieving mother is that my life is over, I'm going to hurt the rest of my life. And and I kind of, well, if I can't be happy, at least I can have a tribe that I belong, I can be part of the grieving mothers. And it was like, really? That those are my choices? And then I just knew because the next question, I'll tell you what I knew. The next question was, can I tell anybody? Do I have to keep my okayness to myself? Like I felt the taboo, the shame, like how could I be okay? I didn't know what okay meant. I just knew I wasn't hurting at that moment. I just knew I wasn't hurting. And and then I've been a truth seeker my whole life. 
uh, I was an obese child and my parents got to the US from the Holocaust and they didn't want to experience any of their grief. And so I would go around the house saying, what's wrong? And they'd say nothing. And that's why I became a psychotherapist because I had to validate what I knew. They wouldn't admit it, but I knew it. And so I had to, I became really good at reading people and acknowledging the truth of what I was experiencing. So at that moment, I knew, I didn't know what it would take, but I knew I had to stand up for truth. I didn't know if it applied to other people. I wasn't following a concept or a path or anybody's grief book. I just knew that I would have to tell the truth about being okay. And then that is what led back to being invited to speak and um, write this book. And the book has more to do with, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that later, but it has more to do with wanting to translate an ancient path called non-duality. And I wanted to tell a story without using any jargon because it, it hasn't gotten, this wisdom hasn't gotten into the hands of people in the West. So I wrote a fable in this book. And then I realized that the story that has a wisdom character arrive to the little girl who's hurting so badly that I had that same experience with a wisdom character in Ireland. And so we had to add a memoir. I say we because my editor and I thought that was a separate story. And then one day we started crying. We said, it has to be in the book also uh, because someone intervened in my life with Melissa and we'd had a rough time earlier in her life. And that rapprochement, the coming together came after meeting this wisdom character. So I know that's a lot more than what you asked for, but it all, it's, it's really my story and why I do the work that I do and what my glimpses class is about. It's, it's teaching that material without any jargon and without calling it non-duality. It's just a way to see basically how our thoughts and our feelings are hurting us because we believe them. So the central thought in, the, in this book is, if thoughts and feelings were truth, they'd be called facts. And if, if we know that one thing, we can look at it as clouds, as rain, as a moment, and do what science tells us and let it go as an, as an energy passing through. It isn't who we are and it isn't permanent. And we can change what we think about it. We can totally. change the story. Or we can put we... a pause in there and just let it go and not add to it. It mm -hmm. changes everything if we do that one thing. And I've found that the reason people don't do it, they love it when they hear it, they want it, and they don't necessarily do it because they believe their thoughts. It's that part where we've been trained to worship our thoughts and our feelings. And that's the one thing one has to really see before it's possible to go the whole way and being okay and not hurting. It, it's just it, like, Go ahead. It applies, I think, to every aspect of your life, your finances, your business, your your relationships with your family, your relationships with strangers. You make up information based on the thoughts that you have in your head and hold them as true. But they're not. <laughs> Nothing is they're true imagination. or not true. Some are right, some are wrong, some are a story, some are partially correct. Mm -hmm. And it's only about memory. If you cut out memory, 
memory is what made you decide this and that, your earlier experiences. So you're judging everything by your conclusions of your earlier experiences. So, And often right. those are, are based on on faulty reasoning because you were either really young when you you first form that thought the way you were going to think around these certain situations and you never took the time to evaluate and decide i'm going to choose to think differently about this and and we actually have the ability to choose different thoughts mm -hmm. and to choose how we um want to remember things yeah. and, you can make up better memories and, and mm -hmm. it sounds silly and it really is very simple, but it's difficult for people to get over that hump that, yeah, I'm allowed to do this. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when you were talking about, um, am I allowed? What I heard is you were feeling, am I allowed to be okay? Even though my daughter passed, yeah. am I allowed to? Yeah, exactly. And and that's true. I had to step away from that myth that I had to, that if I suffered the rest of my life, it proved I loved Melissa. Yeah. Even in that moment, I said, I did love her. I do love her. And I'm okay. Yeah. And it, it's I, okay for you to be okay. Yes. That, that's the thing We're that a lot okay. of people don't won't won't allow themselves to embrace is that it's okay for you to feel however you're feeling and if you're feeling okay then it's okay if you're feeling sad then that's okay too but and the it's not serving was, you the okayness i was talking about yes you're correct a hundred percent that i had to allow myself the okayness in that moment but the okayness that I speak about, I don't want to call it enlightenment because people think enlightenment mean or awakening. They think it means you're mm, all, all the time. No, we're supposed to feel everything just like you were saying. But this okayness is a deeper okayness. I don't have the best words. We could say a contentment, a stability, a place that is not pulled by whatever feeling is being happening, kind of the background, okay in the background. I never had that before. I was one who was very filled with an awareness of unworthiness, of the belief in unworthiness. That's why I now call it imagined unworthiness. I don't call it shame anymore because I think the word shame shames people. Um, they just feel it when they say the word. Um, mm -hmm. But um, it is very possible to have a new home besides the outer world where everything changes every moment. And we're supposed to feel it. If we, and we're supposed to participate. That's why we're alive. But there is a, a place that's not zoned out, if you will, that's just right there with us. And instead of the self-talk that says you're not okay, and what do you need to do to make yourself okay? It, it, it more is coming from okayness, so you don't even have to use an affirmation. It's okay, like you said, to feel whatever you're feeling because it's transient, mm -hmm. but not this. Not, not that, not that home. Yeah. Like every time you take off a too tight shoe or a bra that hurts or something else, it's always that same, ah, that's the home. <laughs> yeah. And to, to recognize what it feels like, mm -hmm. because there are going to be the moments in life with the too tight bra. I can totally relate to that. <laughs> Or the things that don't really feel good to you, but you don't have to live in that. If you know what the, if you know what home feels like, mm -hmm. you can get back to home and you spend more time there if you know what it feels like. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times people don't even know 
what that feels like, or they, it, they fall into it, but then they're pulled right back out. They don't allow themselves to sit in it and then just relax and enjoy and, you know, take that bra off and just be. Yes. They're so busy, like trying to accomplish things or wanting to yes. be something else instead yeah. of just being where they are in the now. Yes. That's so beautiful, Joe. And, you know, I do think we have more experiences of this home, but we've been taught not to value it. So sometimes we're in our car and we drive somewhere. We don't even remember driving there. We were in that neutral place. That's, that's not the mind thinking. It really is a state of complete meditation, but we didn't sit down on a cushion. That is what we're, we're, we're looking for to have this thought stop and have an interruption of that busy mind. So we have that, all of us have had that experience. Every night before we go to sleep, before we're asleep, we're, we know we're not asleep yet, but we let the world go. And there's that, that, but we're, we're taught in school, pay attention, don't daydream. Well, what if daydream? The worst advice like, ever. Right? Right? We're just taught not to value anything that's not doing the being. I mean, it's, it, it's over said, and yet it's still true. We just need to value what you were saying, that home, that taking the bra off. And that nothingness that turns out to be everything. Could you think, what is that like before we go to sleep? And we need sleep. We need to let that world go or we don't feel okay. Well, what is that? You know, why, don't, why are we not? You're just sleepy. We're taught to value energized, right? We're not taught to value letting it all go, doing nothing. Jill, I remember um, before I, I learned all this, I was still in my 30s. I was a psychotherapist and I, I kind of had a busy addiction. I only valued caffeine, getting things done on my list. And you know, Jill, I couldn't even stand my husband sitting there relaxing. I would try to give him ideas of what he could do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can totally relate to that. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about how Enneagrams fit into all of this. Well, I love the Enneagram because it's not, it, it is an ancient personality and spiritual pathway. And I say pathway because it's not, even though we say you're an eight and I'm, I'm a four or whatever, we use those numbers so, so that people don't have a good one and a bad one. And there are names while we're learning it. Mm -hmm. The Enneagram has as its core, you are not that number. Your essence is, is this is your strategy. This is what has worked so far in your life. And for some reason, I got, I got incredible coaching, so maybe that's the reason. But it's my brilliance. If I know somebody's Enneagram, even if they don't want to, to learn about the Enneagram, mm -hmm. I can short circuit the coaching because I know probably what kind of family they grew up in. And I, I check all this out and I don't just take the... I, I have a validated test independent from me mm -hmm. and it's pretty good. It's about 85% correct, but I always check really for sure. This is their home. And then the Enneagram shows the home strategy and I can give you examples, but then the Enneagram points right away to what loosens that strategy. And it's such a welcome piece of acknowledgement 
that the way the person has tried to manage and cope with life worked, has been good, was the best idea for their family, but maybe there's more flexibility, more gifts, that if we add on to those skills, we can have a more fun experience, a lighter experience, more ease with life, more playfulness. And I haven't met a person who doesn't want more joy. I couldn't agree with you more. I have to ask you a question at this point, though. Are you an Enneagram 4? Mm -hmm. You are? Mm -hmm. And you know that I'm an 8? No, I don't know. I just was talking. I am an 8. Yeah. That was I'm interesting. I'm surprised, but I, <laughs> I, just like... I, I wouldn't have, um, I'm not surprised, but I don't try to type people just from these kind of interactions because what I've learned, yeah, most of the time you're right, probably 75%, but sometimes it can be the number just next to you or your father's Enneagram. So I had a whole group of Enneagram experts and we had a newbie therapist join us. Mm -hmm. And everybody thought that she was an eight, even the way she taught, even the way she walked, she was, I am here, power energy, I can do it, leadership skills up the kazoo. And we told her, you know, I would never do this again. We told her, she, you're an eight. And she studied and she studied and she said, no, it's not, it's really not, it's what we realized, it's how she taught, it's how her father was. So when she was teaching, she stepped into her wing on the Enneagram. So it's more complicated than just your type, but she lived in nineness, which is kind of the opposite of, of eight in the sense of nines go away, nines um, really go to sleep to their needs, nines are reluctant leaders in a certain way. So the nine, if you're an eight, that's really lovely that you shared that because that can balance your eightness so beautifully to let it go. Nines are at the top of the circle. So that self-forgetting is the same gift and I'll tell you what I mean by self-forgetting in nines, is the same gift that allows you to open to spirit, open to the cosmos, to the universe, to the divine. So there, our, our listeners can see you have the leadership of an eight, but then if you, let's say you didn't know about all the things you already spoke of home, that tells me you know of what I'm talking about, but let's say you didn't. Now, if we say, hey, look, that's your wing, that's your next door neighbor, it's inviting you to take a break sometimes from managing the world and letting go. And what a relief you've already expressed. You, you feel taking off that bra. You know, the bra would be the eightness, you know, it works. And yes. here I am then buy this do that whatever yeah and you very much show up in in different in different categories mm -hmm. I think in some ways understanding your main enneagram how you show up also um validates mm -hmm. for me it validates some characteristics that people have spoken to me unkindly about in my yes. life Yes. And it's like, well, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, yes, I am like this, but I don't always have to be like this. I can recognize that I have these tendencies, but some people need to be approached differently mm -hmm. and I need to respect that for them as well. Mm -hmm. But just understanding the different um, mm -hmm. personality types. And, mm -hmm. and I look at Myers-Briggs and horoscopes and all kinds of things that kind of play into really figuring out who you are 
mm-hmm. at the core, what, what your mission is when you're here mm-hmm. and, um, and how to, how to present yourself in a way that's not, not like my way or the highway, which mm-hmm. I think sometimes eights can be like, you know, this is, this is the only way to do it rather than I think relaxing back a little bit and saying, well, this is one way to do it. Mm-hmm. What's your idea? And, and recognizing that other people have valuable input to put into and not trying to take on the whole world. Cause I mean, <laughs> for eights as an eight, I can say it's really easy to say, Oh, just do this, this, and the other thing. And we'll solve all the problems. But really that's not going to work because People are just going to do it. So this is a a great example. I'm so happy that you know your Enneagram. So yes, it's very validating. And eights can be called controlling Mm -hmm. and too big and too much because they have a lot of power. They are very... But what the reason I like the Enneagram and have studied it so deeply as a psychotherapist is because it speaks of motivation. Yes, we talk about how you appear in the world, but the motivation for an eight to be, to appear controlling, that's never the motivation. It's not let me be in control of you. It's to not be too vulnerable, to not be hurt. That was the motivation that appears controlling, but for an eight to understand and the others in their life, they're not trying to do anything to you. And if they feel safe and if they are comfortable being vulnerable, so instead of fighting being vulnerable, for an eight to understand that that's my, that's even more power when I can be vulnerable with you. And you can be vulnerable with me. Now we have the possibility of intimacy. And everybody's longing to be seen and heard and connected. Mm -hmm. There's another layer of the Enneagram. I'm wondering if you know your, uh, whether you're social, um, self-prez or intimate. Those are the instincts. Most people don't get to that. But no, I don't. Yeah, so that's another layer because it changes the Enneagram. And I'm guessing, and I, I'm happy to be wrong, I'd like people to take the next test to see, but I'm guessing that you might be social. And social is the most complicated. It, people think it's parties. It, it could be, but it doesn't need to be parties. People could be averse to parties. But so, you know, you gravitate to missions. You, you, you have a broader um, viewpoint in the world than one-to-one. And, and self-preservation would be you lead from your own supplies. Am I too tired? Am I? But everybody has all three. But it's which do you lead with? And so just can you imagine if you are an eight and you're social, what do you, how do you think that would appear differently than if you were one-to-one? Just, just for our viewers to even go along with you. In terms of, yeah, in terms of, um, speaking to larger audiences it exactly you would want you would even imagine first even that question shows you're you're geared to larger audience larger but but it isn't just about accumulation it's about your vision you're a visionary for larger than you and me and this other person and your daughters and whatever but the, so that's the high side. The high side, I'm a self pres so I can add that on later. First, I have to make sure I've had enough food, enough sleep, that all my physical, it's, it, it's just how you're wired. That's not more selfish. And then my next skill would be one-to-one. My 
third skill, which I had to, I didn't have to, I desired to develop more because whichever is our lowest is the one we can get the more gifts from. Because you already know how to do the mission, the big picture. That's you. You're wired that way. I'm 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 feeling. Um, but the the what you could learn is let's say I don't know you well enough to say, but let's say just from a guess from what you said that your lowest might be one to one. That you would then have to pay more attention, like consciously learn, like you mentioned, oh, people are receiving my behavior and motivation differently than I was intending. Let me learn that and get more consciously attuned to how people are hearing it, then I can change it because it's not me. You, that, isn't, that isn't your core. Your core is none of those personality traits. All of them right. and none of them. You're something else, something larger, less limited. So then we can open. It's not a personal criticism. We can open to the, the gifts, the, the opportunities. Uh, so this is so fun. We couldn't have we couldn't have created this if we decided to talk about. Yeah, this. I think it's fascinating. It, it's and it's not just for eights. I mean, it's like no, all no, of the enneagrams. Every number, it's all, has, every all, number of has all of these pieces. I, I just I I thought it was so fascinating that you just said I'm a four and you're an eight. I was like, how did you know? <laughs> did you read my mind? <laughs> no, I have some data for how you. I mean, if I were trying to consciously, which I, I have trained myself not to do, uh -huh. because then I will read people on a guess and then fit everything into that. And I, yeah, there, you, you can know how you act and, and there's always a reason. So I would be right about what I'd be observing, but it might not be your Enneagram. It might be your parent. It might be a wing. It might be an arrow, but but now that I know that, if you compare what you offer to people who are coming to be on your podcast with other podcasts, hosts, what they offer, it's voluminous. Read this, do that, listen to the video, now do this. It <laughs> is very eightish in in neither good or bad. It's it's powerful. It's large it's gracious it's leadership and if somebody were having problem with all of that then it would be up to them to then speak to you and say well uh, can i still be on your podcast without doing this 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 and then you would you would know where they were coming from that they are a different enneagram and so then you would know at this point, because you're so evolved, I can tell, but there, there is evidence. We, we leave evidence for, um, for who we are. Um, and, and if we know how to pick it up, it, it improves our relationships because we're Enneagrams talking to each other. Yeah. Our Enneagrams are talking to each other. Yeah. And they bring... Yeah, everybody has something unique and yummy that they bring to the the party, so to speak. And we need all of them. It's not like yeah. one is better than the other. It's None. just different. That's why I like the Enneagram better than the diagnostic manual because there are no bad Enneagrams. And, and yeah. everybody within their Enneagram is healthier or unhealthier, uh, depending on the moment of the day. And we, yeah. we know that we go up and down, if, depending how tired we are, what has happened to us. So, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. So how do you actually work with people? Is it one on one groups? Um, I have courses? two groups that have been ongoing. And um, right now, I've opened up some spots to work with me individually to take the test and I will um, tell them how to take the test. I give certain guidance 
uh, for example, um, and I'm, it's not a secret, you can look up the wisdom of the Enneagram or Riso and Hudson, and I like their test the best. Take it from age about 25, not how you've evolved. Uh, because when you're anxious or stressed or have a crisis, you're going to go back to your home Enneagram. So that's fine that you notice you don't do that anymore, but answer how you used to do it. Um, so they, uh, they meet with me for 15 minutes, see if I'm for you, what I can offer you, and then take the test. Then we do an in-depth, um, really uncovering, uh, unpacking of what the Enneagram <clears throat> could be in your life. So we would start probably from a situation that's troubling or that is an obstacle you're handling or something juicy in your life. And then I would show you how the Enneagram is influencing that behavior, that motivation, those issues. And I would say also, I check out to make sure that is the correct Enneagram because many eights diagnose on the test as twos because they prefer to see themselves as helpers. Does that surprise you? No, not no. at all. And so I have to make sure if I get a two from the test that it is secretly an eight, that they just are have, have been shamed about being big and yeah. too much. And so they just see that helper quality from an eight goes to two on the arrow, right? For the longest time, I, I was told my whole life, you're so bossy. Stop being bossy, Jill. To sit down and shut up. Um, when I was the oldest of three girls and we traveled all over the world and I I always had to be in charge. Whether I wanted to or not, that was my job because I was the oldest and we were always meeting new people. So later in life, my husband came to me and he said, I heard the best thing the other day. It's perfect for you. It, he said, um, the comeback to you're so bossy is I'm not bossy. I'm just overly helpful. So I've embraced that. <laughs> That's lovely. And, you know, um, eights only do that when the situation actually, uh, unless they're compulsive, which can happen. But often it's because there's a vacuum and a need for leadership. Because yeah. I bet you you can step back and let someone else lead if they're capable. And you see the bonus for you in not being the leader of everything. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's very true. I often I'll see a vacuum and I try to wait now. I didn't always, but I, I do try to wait and see if somebody else wants to step up and I'll ask, you know, does anybody else want to do this job? Cause I don't necessarily want to do it. I will do it. I'm capable of doing it. I have confidence in myself. Yeah. But you so can have confidence in yourself too. <laughs> yeah. You're very, you're very healthy. Eight. And that's some of what, what many eights want to learn. And that other piece of, am I being perceived? Am I being received with the, in a way that's consonant? That's the way I mean to be in, to intending. Is it, mm -hmm. is it a match? And if people are receiving you in a way you don't intend, then then there is a motivation to pull back some of the energy so you can be heard the way you intended. Um, it's so, the vulnerability issue in yeah. there too. I, I, I don't like conflict and I, but you're I good am, it, I bet you, you can hold your own and, and you can handle conflict. You may not like it. I, I can, I'll avoid it at all costs. That's that's who I that's am. That's that nine. That's that nine and the merging. So that's mm -hmm. why this is such a great example of why I like the Enneagram. Nobody's purely this and that. And so the merging and to be able to see, oh, yay, my nine is coming forth when there's conflict. That's going to soften me. That's going to make me yeah. even better at conflict resolution, even though I don't care for it. 
it's out there whether you want it or not you're going to stumble into it so yeah yeah it's just just where where are you going to put that emergency exit (laughs) yeah and so after um people take the test and I meet with them to make sure we have it and then we start applying it and people really get their enneagram and I, I do the pacing I make sure they really not only understand it but in in a way love it and are embarrassed by it until there's that revelation like oh I didn't want anybody to know that you know then you really have your enneagram if you just love it like a seven might say oh I just love being the fun light one Mm, you need to see you're avoiding things and big things and that's why you're so much fun um and until there's that gulp of oh everybody's gonna know that that knows the enneagram then then you really have something do you know what i mean you have your entrance and then we do the instinct because i want people before they look at the books and and get lost and just have it be another test i would like them to have a lens to see themselves with respect and kindness and opportunity because there are so many opportunities from the knowing their own enneagram and then we want to see if they if they're coaches then they want to know this the enneagram is the most helpful for coaches because i watch coaches in very, very high investment programs that don't know the Enneagram. And when they have a client that won't land the plane, meaning write the book, if it's a book writing group, uh, make a decision on the investment offering or go back and forth, that's an Enneagram that is more safe and comfortable not landing the plane, staying in this or that, this or that. You try and take that away with coaching strategies. Okay, what are you going to do this week? No, it's not going to work. They'll, they'll, they'll just defy it and come back next week with this or that. So knowing the Enneagram is just a window into the deepest place that's going on with someone. It's not just a party game like so many of these things are. And so if people want to go deeper, I have offerings, both individual and group, uh, for people to proceed. But just knowing your own type is an incredible gift. You you made a point that I, I really want to circle back to. You said, until you feel that that gut check with your anagram, that gut check is like the gift. Yes. It's, it's that thing that you face and you're like, you know it, yes. but when, when it, it, it's right there in black and white or whatever color you want to use on your yes, yes, computer yes. screen. But, um, and it's what you're going to feel about it and how you're going to incorporate that into your life. And it's powerful in the way that it, it just is okay. Like there's bossiness and there's vulnerability in in an eight. Bossiness is embarrassing to me. I've been shamed about it so much in my life that being faced with that was like, yeah, this is a characteristic. I recognize it in myself. And being vulnerable, that's also a characteristic. And I sometimes the bossiness comes from that. But knowing those is also very powerful because. It allows me to to pull back. Mm-hmm. It, it gives me the information that says, you know, I'm too much for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And if you look at other enneagrams, you can you can soft pedal to to different people in in terms of you know how they're going to to protect you. And you know the one on one thing that we were talking about the the social um, self preservation or one on one that is my lowest one because it's it took me the longest time to figure out that i need to approach groups much differently than i approach individuals mm-hmm. they'll 
they'll get more benefit. And if they get more benefit one-on-one, -on -one, then the larger community will, will yeah. prosper. It, it's, it's the whole mission thing. Yeah, that's so. um, I I want to offer you something. Um, I think it's beautiful that you made friends with the word bossy. Um, I had to make friends with the word death. Um, I wanted to say passed on transition, you know, which gives you a whole other feeling like it didn't really happen. It's just another movement. I had yeah. to make friends with that word. But now, bossy is really the interpretation of the other person. So I acknowledge you that you made friends with that. Now you can just call it leadership. Yeah. Because because there it's not bossy unless the person sees it as too much. That's the other person's lens. And there are going to be times when you lead and it's not bossy because your one-to-one -one calibration is correct. You, you've softened your voice, you've chosen your words, you, you, you ask, would someone else like to do this? Like you said, I don't have to, that is not bossy, but it's still leadership. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's something, a next level, which you, 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 you I could see it's not even new for you. Um, that you had to make friends with bossy and now you can just call it leadership. And then that opens it up to, oh, it actually isn't bossy. If I see it as bossy, that's on me, not yeah. on you. Yeah, that, that, very profound. Mm -hmm. It has been, again, the Enneagram, I, it has been so helpful in that respect. It, it's even without somebody coaching me on it, it has helped me come to terms with how I want to present myself in the world. Yeah, you were ready for it. And somehow your original materials were accessible. Sometimes even the word Enneagram, it sounds hard and the words are old and it's off-putting and out of deference to the ancient tradition that it used to be thought of as being so powerful that nobody was to write it down. And the Jesuits for, were the first person people to write down the Enneagram. Um, but, you know, you were ready. And so it, it, it came to you in a deep way. Some people yeah. are just scared by the possibilities rather than stepping a little bit at a time and just taking it in and, and taking the treasures that are yours. You don't need to understand a whole Enneagram. Now, if there is a problem with the person, so many people have inner conflicts. They might not even be in the world, but with someone. And we can figure out their Enneagram and why that Enneagram is trouble for you. So there's we, we then take the Enneagram and personalize it to what's going on in your life. What do you need and how can the Enneagram be you know, of assistance and open things up rather than close it? We never end with, well, there are an eight or there are two or there are what? No, that's that's only the beginning. Yeah, that's, that's like the door <laughs> and behind it. There's so much more information. Yeah, yeah. That can help you both build a better relationship together. Which right. is like and your Enneagrams are talking to each other. So like the person who sees, sees leadership as too much, um, that's about their Enneagram of having been overwhelmed and maybe not seen and um, passed over. And so you, you offering something, sometimes it's even jealousy that they can't and would like to be able to do that and they have the constriction of their enneagram so now they're going to make you wrong rather than feel like they're they can't do what they would like to do too so wherever um, one of my coaches used to call it when you when you're like you are with your enneagram you're easy in your harness 
the harness is still there. You still have that enneagram, but it's not constricting. It's not hurting. It's like that bra we talked about. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> Bras. <laughs> Sorry. I have a love hate relationship with them. <laughs> I understand. Most women do. <laughs> so you you offer a quiz over on your site um, for people if they're just like getting ready to learn more. Yeah, it's not an Enneagram quiz. It's an unworthiness quiz. Um, I feel underneath all of the Enneagrams, because we're humans, unworthiness is another lens to understand why we're all stuck. So when we go back to what we talked about earlier, if someone doesn't believe that the thoughts and feelings are transitory. Why wouldn't they? they? Let's try on a hypothesis. If I think I'm unworthy, then that unworthiness is like a solid soul beingness judgment. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me thoughts and feelings are just just transitory energy. Well, I'm going to believe my unworthiness more than what you just told me. And that unworthiness, prove it. Show me this unworthy person. Where, where are they? Oh, you did that? Well, that was then. You felt that? that? Where is it? Is it here now? You're going back with memory. So the unworthiness quiz is actually like a course it has the core it has the quiz with questions that are really good and then it talks to you about about how unworthiness could possibly be imagined so it, it, it it's something i've dealt with i believed in unworthiness fours are very connected to that feeling they believe it's the truth so we imagine rejection, even when it's not there, because we've rejected ourselves. So uh, yeah, that's the unworthiness quiz. Um, but come and talk to me for, a, there's a 15 minute conversation we can have about the Enneagram. And we, we work, not work, we, we get together in a meeting twice a month it's not an Enneagram class. It's not a teaching. It's a, what does glimpses of awakening mean? It means having an experience, like you mentioned earlier, the experience of home. That's what glimpses of awakening is. And we offer those twice a month for free to get to know me, to get to know my community, our community. And um, it's a great way to, um, to connect. Um, so if any of this is pulling you, then you'll know. And that's a good way to use one of these freebies. Website is rosalindrourke.com. So easy. Thank you. I was just going to ask you. <laughs> and we'll be sure to put that in the show notes. So Rosalind, this has been an amazing conversation. I have really enjoyed it a lot. What is the one thing that you would hope the audience takes away from what we've discussed today? Now, one sentence, if thoughts and feelings were truth with a capital T, if I could believe all of my thoughts and feelings, then they would be called facts. If you can just add a little bit of doubt and say, maybe this is happening, maybe this feeling of perceived mistakes is a story, maybe, just any doubt, you've opened a door to peace, contentment, no matter what's happening outside. I love that. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Love being here with you.
Thank you so much for tuning in to another empowering episode of the You World Order Showcase podcast. We hope you've enjoyed hearing from our incredible life, health, and transformational coaches who are making a profound impact on the world. Remember, change begins with you, and you have the power to transform your life and the lives of others. If you want to take that next step and unlock your true potential, visit thecoachesalchemist.com where you can find the three ways we can help you for free to spin your talent into gold with clarity, a system, and a plan. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an inspiring episode. And if you enjoyed today's show, we'd greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Your feedback means the world to us and helps us reach more people with our positive message. Stay connected with us on social media for updates, behind the scenes content, and upcoming guest announcements. You can find us on Facebook at the U World Order or simply visit thecoachesalchemist.com. 